Section 12.2, some examples of static equilibrium. So now we'll get to see the equations and concepts of the last chapter put into practice. Now, a couple things apply force and torque conditions for static equilibrium. That's what I just mentioned. The other thing is identify a wise choice about the placement of the origin about which to calculate the torques. Because we'll see the wise choice can simplify calculations by eliminating unknown forces from the torque equation. That's a little preview of what's coming. So let's first look at checkpoint two. The figure gives an overhead view of a uniform rod in static equilibrium. First, question A. Can you find the magnitudes of unknown forces in F1 and F2 by balancing the forces? I want you to think about this, so go ahead and hit pause. Okay, hopefully you did think about it. Let's see. So if we balance the forces, I'm going to sum up the forces. I'm just gonna sum them up in the y direction because why not? No, because we don't have any x forces here. They're all in the vertical direction. And it's in static equilibrium, so the net force must be equal to zero. And balancing the forces is really quick when they're all in the y direction like this. I notice I just have 20 newtons and F2 are up. So plus F2 plus 20 newtons, and then the other three are down. So minus 10 newtons minus F1 minus 30 newtons is all equal to zero. And so if we simplify here, we have 20 minus 40, that just becomes minus 20. So F2 is equal, or yeah, I won't do too much at once. F2 minus F1 minus 20 newtons is equal to zero, or in other words, F2 is equal to F1 plus 20 newtons. Cool, so we got a really useful equation here but we don't have the magnitudes of these two forces because we only have one equation with two unknowns. And if we summed up the forces in the x direction, wouldn't tell us anything. So are we done? No, because we also still have torques. So let's look at part B. If we wish to find the magnitude of force two by using a balance of torques equation, where should you place a rotation axis to eliminate F1 from the equation? So if we want to eliminate a force uh, from the torque equation, we want to put our rotation axis where r will be zero, so that the torque due to that force is zero. So I'm going to put a rotation axis right here. And you can draw it as you like. I like to do sort of an x, like a little turntable. Um, but you could also just label it O or just put a point there. The key is I recommend drawing something to help you out to remember what it is. And yeah, if we put it there, then notice when we go to do the net torque, the balance of torques equation, where the net torque is equal to zero, we can add up all the torques and that one is going to be at a distance of zero. So here I'm going to use the equation that torque is equal to r perpendicular times the force. And so we could do it for each of these where I have 20 newtons uh, times the r perpendicular. The distance from this axis of rotation of the 20 newtons is 60. And then also the sine of that torque is about that rotation axis it is causing a clockwise rotation. So I'd call that negative. And I could continue on to this 10 Newtons, right? And that is 10 Newtons at a distance of 2D. So I'm really doing force times R perpendicular here. Uh, but that is causing a counterclockwise rotation. So that would indeed be positive. All right, F1 is at a distance of zero. I can still write that in, um, plus F1 times zero. Cool, so that doesn't do anything. Continuing on, we have 30 Newtons at a distance of D from our axis of rotation. I don't wanna to get too far in the corner, so I'm gonna come right here. 
and that 30 newtons is causing a clockwise rotation. So that's a negative torque. You need to keep that sign in there. And then finally we have F2. And that is at a distance of 2D from the axis of rotation. And it is causing a counterclockwise rotation. So that is positive and all of those have to add up to zero. There we go. So we notice that the zero term here goes away. And what are we left with? 20 times six is 120. So negative 120 D and then two times 10 is 20, so plus 20 D. I'll draw a line here so I don't get too confused on which line is what. And then minus 30 D and plus two F two D is equal to zero. And hopefully what we can see there is that notice what's the same in every one of these terms is they all have a D. So we can divide out the Ds because they're in every single term. We could even divide by two, but I'll wait to do that because the math is a little simpler beforehand. Negative 120 plus 20 becomes negative 100 minus 30, so that's negative 130. Uh, plus 2 F2 is equal to 0. And so what we get is that F2 is equal to 65 newtons. Sorry, that's a little low there. There we go. So part C, magnitude of F2 turns out to be 65 newtons. What then is the magnitude of F1? Well, I realized I should stop sharing so the whiteboard's a little bigger. Here we go, sorry about that. So we solved for F2 is equal to 65 Newtons here. Cool, that's great. Once we know this, now we can go back to our balance of torques equation, which I started to erase here. What we previously got is that F2 is just equal to F1 plus 20 newtons. And that equation didn't take very much work to get to. So F1 is just going to be F2 minus 20 newtons. So F1 is equal to 65 newtons minus 20 newtons. And so that will just come to a 45 newtons. All right, so there we have an example of how when we approached a problem, the balance of forces wasn't enough to solve it. It was really useful and it's a great way to quickly get equations, but then we also needed the balance of torques. And many of the problems in this chapter will involve both one of the balance of forces equations, maybe both, and a balance of torques equations. So stay tuned, we'll see some more examples as we go.